Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing Kate Elliott. Hey there. How are you today? I am good. And how are you? I am doing great. Um, As I was saying before we started recording, I literally just finished reading your book. Um, And it is just so incredible. So I'm like sitting over here, like just processing, thinking about all the different things that happened because it's it's a real good ending. Um. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a complicated ending. And so I'm really delighted that it worked for you. Mm. It was it was really expertly done. Um, Do you want want to talk a little bit about that? Of course, without spoilers, but. Oh, the hard. Yeah. The hard thing about talking about things uh, without spoilers. Servant Mage is a fantasy novella, which I should say is super short for me. I usually write long books in series and not episodic series, you know, where each episode stands alone, but like a three book series where you Mm -hmm. read the whole thing to get the full story. And one of the reasons I wrote Servant Mage was to just practice. You know, it's always a challenge to do something new. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see, can I tell a complete story in this shorter, in this shorter format? Uh, And I wanted to tell a story that kind of went against a lot of the things that I typically see and that many people see or have seen in the past in the fantasy genre. And so I felt like as the writer, I needed to set up the things that readers expect and then start undermining them by the way I wrote it. So that at the end, some readers have been surprised about what happens at the end, but readers, other readers have seen where I was going with it. So it's just been really interesting to see people's takes on it. Does that, was that good enough? I mean, I really don't say that much. Yeah, Uh, no, it, I, I definitely can see why you've had like mixed responses to how people are, how people are taking it personally for me, what happened was what I wanted to happen, which I want to happen in honestly, most fantasy books (laughs) that doesn't happen. Um, And so I found it really satisfying. And I, I, I was, I was a bit surprised because like I said, it doesn't really turn the way that it turned in this most of the time. Because I've, you know, I've written so much. One of the advantages, I should say, of having written a lot. This is my Servant Mage is my 28th novel, Mm -hmm. um, although technically it's a novella, but let's just call it a novel. Uh, And I've written so many different variations of every possible thing you could do in fantasy and science fiction. Not all of them, obviously. There's still plenty to go. That for me, doing something different is part of the part of the charm of writing. Mm. that I want to, you know, talk about revolution. And I want to talk about what does monarchy mean? And I want to talk about the choices people have. Some people have more choices than other people. And what does it mean? What does it mean to have freedom? And what happens to the little people after the revolution, the ones who weren't really helped by it? So it, I, I put a lot of those things into this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you, can you actually speak on that a little bit? Like the, the use of politics in Servant Mage and in just kind of in fantasy in general. There's an old, I, there's an old kind of a canard, I guess I will say, where people sometimes ask, why do people write fantasy novels? Why are American authors in particular, so it goes, so it said, uh, so obsessed with monarchy? And I'm not so sure that American writers in particular are obsessed with monarchy. Monarchy existed and still exists and did for a long time. I think that it can be easy to treat monarchy as some kind of a, as a, I don't even know how I would say it, as a, as a, an easier way to understand the world or an easy way to understand how politics and power change hands. Mm-hmm. So, so I've always, I've always examined monarchy, and I haven't always examined monarchy. I've written books about revolution. I've written books about monarchy. I'm what I'm interested in in fantasy and in science fiction is how does power work in a society? Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I bring to, and that's very analytical because mostly what I'm interested in is the people. Who are these people, and why do I care about them? I mean, that's always the center of what I write. So I, 
I want to write Felian's story. Who is she and how does she fit into this world? But there's another part of me that writes thematically. I'm kind of always arguing with myself and talking about the world and trying to understand the world. Why is the world this way? Why do we act this way? Why do these things happen? And I can kind of work through that in the stories I write. And so I tend not to try to, I try to tend to write different kinds of angles on different things about power and about society and about setting and about who the character are and characters are and where characters fit in different stories. I have different characters who fit in different places in the world so that I can examine worlds and power from all angles in a way for me, for me in speculative fiction, it offers a chance for me to do that. That would be harder than if, if I did it in a historical novel or in a contemporary, because then there's, it, it gives me more leeway because I'm kind of the person who controls what the setting is. And that gives me more leeway to say, well, I want to write this person who is from the hill country and she isn't part of any of the power dynamics or the power brokers in this world. So I can talk about her, but because I set that up. So that's what I like about speculative fiction. It allows me to really wrestle with things that I don't understand or things that trouble me about the world. And I use that I use it in that way a lot. And that's what I did with this. Um, this idea of monarchy as becoming corrupt, we see that a lot. We you see aristocracies where the money gets pulled up, fewer and fewer people control the resources and the money and the labor. That sounds familiar. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I know, right? And um, whether whatever we call it, but in the past, it has often been called monarchy. And then these revolutions happen. And sometimes these revolutions really work to help make the world better for people. And sometimes they just impose a different set of restrictions and they just put a different group of people into power who are in their own way corrupt in ways that hurt the small people, the everyday people going about their everyday lives. And that is really what I wanted to examine with Servant Mage. Felion, our heroine, is caught between these two factions, the liberationists, who are the revolutionaries, and the monarchists, who have been kind of fighting a losing battle for decades now to, to try to restore their power. And she's caught in the middle of them. And the kind of the game I play as the writer is to get the reader to wonder, what is Felion going to choose? Which faction is she going to choose? Um, and, and I do play some games as the writer with that because I make one faction look bad pretty much out of the gate. Mm. And then I take my time investigating what the other faction looks like and who Felion really is and where she comes from, which to me is the centerpiece of what's most important about her, where she comes from and that anchor she has because she comes from a place where she has real connections to her family, the family she was separated from. Does that make sense? That absolutely does. That, that was like an excellent answer to that. And, and you know, that term speculative fiction, it's one that for some reason I can never remember. Um, but I should, because I, I talk about it a lot on this show. Um, and I, I think it's, it can provide like some of the most interesting things. That's why I've always been a lover of fantasy and science fiction. Um, can can you talk talk a little bit on that though, seeing as you've written both fantasy and science fiction in this speculative format, what are some of the key differences in those? Or when it comes down to it, is it just the world that you're writing in? I, If you mean like, what do I think are the key differences between science fiction and fantasy as genres? Is like in your writing process. In my writing process, I have to say that there are many people who like to draw lines between the two, but I don't really. To me, it's a world that isn't grounded in the realism of this one. And as soon as I start separating it away from this world, whether it's a contemporary set story that has a fantastical element in it, or whether it's set in a world that doesn't exist, that world could exist in a kind of a past, right, with lower technology, or it could exist in a far future with technology that 
kind of functions like magic, right? But which is perhaps, you know, reasonable that we could have developed in, you know, 500 years from now or whenever, mm-hmm. including things like space flight of some kind or another. Uh, to me, to me, they function both as, I guess, what is often called a secondary world. It's not this world. It's another world. So I kind of treat them the same. I don't really... The biggest difference, I've also I'm also in the process right now of writing a space opera trilogy. Um, the first volume is called Unconquerable Sun, and it's out from Tor Books. It's um the the, the short version of it is gender spun Alexander the Great in space. And that is Ooh. literally that is literally what it is. That but, sounds really good. Yeah, the biggest, the biggest difference for me is that. When I write that two characters are on a train, I don't have to explain what a train is. And that's nice. So there's a shorthand involved with a lot of science fiction that I might have to be more careful about with fantasy. Because mm. I don't want people to... The, the, I, I think one of the biggest challenges of writing fantasy is fighting against people's um, very... and. and fighting against Hollywood's simplistic portrayal of the past. Yes. Yeah. So people begin to think that, well, we know this is how it was like back then. Well, usually it wasn't the way Hollywood portrayed it. And so you kind of have to, you're kind of fighting that all the time. And people say, I actually, one of the classic examples is that when people say, oh, you know, the, that new BBC three musketeers that came out a couple of years ago, you know, look at, Look at what they did. They made um, Porthos. Po- Porthos is is played by a black guy. Well, that's just ridiculous. Except that Dumas' father was was mixed race. He was a, he was a marshal in Napoleon's army, and his mother was from maybe hate maybe Haiti. What we now call Haiti, I don't know. So Dumas himself was mixed race. So it's not at all unrealistic for someone in the modern day to cast this actor as Porthos, Mm -hmm. but people's idea is, but people, you fight people's ideas in a way and their expectations. Or, or like the idea that it's like, what I see so much in um, like Hollywood fantasy, Mm -hmm. as you were saying, is where it, it makes it look as if the only thing that exists is like white men. (laughs) <laughs> and that's it and it's and like I look at it and I'm like well where are the where are people of color where are women where are people of different like sexualities and classes and why is it all so narrow and that's what that's a part of why I love books like Servant Mage because it can have a bit of a wider perspective on things like that and make it feel much less limited yeah it's Every time, you know, these old these old films where there's, you know, two women who have lines and 50 men who have lines in the Mm -hmm. whole film, including all the people who have one line. Right. It does give a funny view of the past when, in fact, if you read about history worldwide throughout many regions and eras, the past is amazing. And people were were doing a lot of they were up to a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. In a in a very wide range of of ways, in ways that we that that if we do, if you don't know it though, if you're stuck in this idea that it couldn't have been like that, then 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 you will read something or you will watch something on TV and you will say, well, that's not realistic, because women never spoke before the year 1900. They weren't allowed to speak out loud. You know, if that's your idea, you know, that's a, I'm kind of exaggerating, but. Yeah, but like just because their stories um, aren't being told, like in history class, doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't exist. (laughs) Like, yeah, and, and there's all this evidence. A lot of it is that there's all this evidence there that back in the day. The people writing the history just ignored. So my my mm-hmm. sister is actually a medievalist. She her 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 specialty is a medieval German literature. But she has a friend who was doing work in the I, my, I'm not going to get these details right in either Holland in medieval late medieval Holland or the or Belgium. I'm not sure which. And she mm-hmm. found this 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 trove of documents of business accounts about businesses that were being run by women. But we're told, we were often told that women couldn't do business in 
Europe at, at that, you know, in 1400, but they were. It's there. Literally, the proof is there, but it isn't circulated and discussed. So one of the great things about writing fantasy is that ability to kind of pull up this more, this reality of how people really lived and put it in a fantasy novel. Yes, a hundred percent. Yeah. So like, aside from the more like political angle to it and looking at the historical context, what sort of work did you do to establish your fantasy world for this book? I, I wanted to, I, so for this book, I knew that I had to establish that there was the aftermath of a civil war. So I had to establish that there had been the group, the revolutionaries who won, who won, but the war isn't really quite over yet. And then the monarchists who were overthrown. And this isn't a spoiler because you see this at the beginning. And one of the ways I did that, uh, and I find this kind of funny because the cover of the book is wonderful because um, the design department and the wonderful cover artist, Tommy Arnold, mm-hmm. um, they, they paid attention to this. But this, the story opens in the in the back courtyard where the, where the privies are. Um, And there's a mural decorating it because of course, visual scenes were a way in which societies that had a low literacy rate would tell the stories they wanted to tell. That's one reason that you see stained glass, which tells different parts of stories from the Bible in cathedrals in from, from the middle ages in Europe, for example. And so I have, there's a mural there and I can kind of, tell a bit of the background story by describing this mural. Oh, um, that's so cool. You know, and that's why, if, and if you look at the cover of the book, there's, you see the mural in the background and the guy with the, with the shovel, because I talk about that, the, you know, the guy with the shovel, the ditch digger. Um, so I had to set up that context. And then the, and of course I had to set up Felian and what her background is, which I do again in the first scene. And this is kind of a hint about who she is and what the theme of the story is by showing her secretly teaching a couple of people to read. Mm -hmm. And that right there tells you that it's forbidden for her to do that, forbidden for them to learn that. And of course, that's something that comes in part from, for example, our our history, our own history in the United States, where um, in the period of chattel slavery, when Black Africans and their descendants were enslaved, in speci- specifically in the South, um, they there were many places where they simply were not allowed to read. And one of the fascinating stories in the wake, or actually during the period of the Civil War, when many of them were fleeing behind Union lines and finding safety, like in a port city in, in North Carolina, but what the first thing they did was set up schools mm-hmm. because they understood how important that was. And, and having read things like that, and because my father was an educator, that was that was another thing that was important to me to kind of like put into the story. So now you know kind of where she comes from. And then the last piece of it is magic because this is a fantasy novel, and I wanted to put in like big M magic so that you can see it and you know how it works and you know how it how it manifests and what it does in society. And then it that and then I also had to fold how the magic works into the social the social culture and the civil war aspect to show how the people in power could control the people with magic ability and use it to enhance their power rather than the magicians having enough power to be their own power base so that i hope that made sense because you know if the magician has i've also written a story where the mages are part of the ruling class that's mm. the spirit walker trilogy that starts with cold magic it's set in kind of an early 19th century setting. Um, But I, so I've also written that because that's another way to look at it. Why wouldn't if mages had magic, why wouldn't they rule as opposed to serve Kings? Right. So, but this is the flip side of that. What is it about this magic that the people in power can control it? Yeah. I really, I loved, I loved the magic system in this book so much. Um, And like the way that you talk about like, how it's the wraiths and so I, I don't want to I don't want to get too too spoilery. I had so much fun I had so much fun um 
setting that all up and thinking it through. Mm, yeah. yeah. As a reader, I could kind of, I could kind of tell in some parts that I was like, Oh, it looks like she had fun with this, yeah. um, with yeah. this plot point. And, and I love that so much because you can kind of, it kind of draws you in more when you can feel that the author was enjoying what they were doing. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, that's what we hope for, right? That mm. that we that as writers, we're we're translating our passion and our excitement to the reader. Yeah. Um, so you've written, as you as you mentioned at the top of the show, you've done a number of different fantasy books and science fiction books and um, series. How was the like after now that you've done so many of these? Do you have like a set um, thing that you do for outlining and getting everything set up for the writing process? Is it kind of streamlined or is it different? No, I just cry a lot. Oh, yes. (laughs) Yeah, You know, the one I've learned a couple of things. One is, is that each book will end up being written a little differently. Um, No matter my best attempts to create a a process that I can count on, something always happens. So like the the second book of the of the space opera, which um, I finished and revised last year, it, Mm. it, it took me I must have spent six months rewriting the first third six or seven times before I finally made it line up right. And then I wrote the rest. But back in the day, I would always write a complete first draft and then go back and fix it. So it, it, you know, and at some point what I've learned is I just have to say to myself, oh, I see it's going to be this way, is it? <laughs> and, and kind of accept that each book is going to write a little differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but my general process, my overall process is that I usually have to spend a little time, a, a year, two years, three years, kind of letting it percolate the world building and and to some and the characters and how they fit together because how they fit together is how the plot is going to work they they have to live in their world they they should they can't be me in my world with my ideas living in some made up world they have to fit into their world the same way i fit into my world mm-hmm. you know and their ideas of how the world works needs to fit for who they are in their world so it takes me a while to let that. It'd be like putting some stew on the back burner. And it just takes a while for that meat to, to cook. So that's kind of my general way. Um, I usually have, I need to know what my end point is before I start writing. And, um, and then how I get there can shift a little bit. But the only other thing that's consistent for me as a writer is that there's always some question or other that comes up in the course of writing it that I don't know the answer to. And I've learned that I just have to trust that I will figure it out, that at some point it will just like fall on me like a piano. And Interesting. So far, so good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Would, you, I, would you mind sharing what the questions were for some of your books? Oh, you mean that I wasn't sure about? Oh, yeah, I, I can have a good example. So I have a, a my one of my early science fiction series is uh, I call it the novels of the Geron. The first book is Geron. It's set a couple hundred years in our future. It's supposed to be the future of Earth. Uh, and the it, the first novel is about um, a young woman who ends up on a on a low technology planet and how she's trying to get back to her brother, who is an important political player. Earth has been kind of absorbed by this large alien empire and and um, she has to get back to him. Um, and of course, there might be a romance and she, you know, mm-hmm. she's there might she kind of falls in love with the culture that she's traveling with. Um, so for it's, it's a, I guess it's an early example kind of a, of a fantasy romance or what they call a planetary romance and, a, and me kind of writing and devising this whole culture. In a later, so there's four books written in that series. And in the fourth book, the main character was the, is the illegitimate son of the main character, the the male lead in the first book. And there's a whole reason why illegitimacy doesn't really exist in that, the culture he's from, but it did with him for various reasons that are part of the culture. Mm -hmm. But I knew he was the main character. And I knew what the basic, I knew the, the plot of the book. But when I started writing him, he was just wrong. 
he, he talked funny and every every scene he was in just wrote strange. It was just wrong. And I thought I can wait. And, and this is a multi point of view book. The, mm-hmm. Everybody else I got, I knew where they were going. Um, so I just said, you know what, I'm just going to write his scenes wrong. And I'm going to trust that at some point it'll happen. And about two thirds of the way through the book, finally, there's a scene where he and the man who fathered him um, or uh, they are alone. They're captive and they have a discussion and their different views of how to deal with this captivity. All of a sudden, the son spoke because his way of dealing with the situation was so different from his father's. And that was it. And all of a sudden I had him. That oh, scene, so I cool. had him. Yeah, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. And so I was then able to go back and write all his scenes correctly back up to that point. So mm-hmm. that's my best example. I love that so much. Um, I, I love, I always love hearing stories like that on here because it's those magic moments that really make the writing process. It, it It's true. It's a form of magic that I can't explain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and partly I do write because I know that something is going on back in my brain that I can't see past whatever veils there are. Right. But that if I'm trusting, it'll come forward. And when those things happen, I just, it's almost, it's, it's almost gleeful. You know, it's like, you're kind of grinning and going, yes, that's it. That's it. And that's, it's a joyful moment. And it's also really exciting. And it's one of the things I love about writing. Yeah. And like, I personally, I write a lot of I write a lot of poetry. So it's, that's like what I'm, I mostly yeah. write. So I'm not usually yeah. as focused on characters that aren't me, um, and, but I'll be writing and all of a sudden, like I'll get that, that line that I needed. And it, it, it's just, it feels like the, it's like the greatest feeling in the world. Um, and I, and I love reading those moments too, because a lot of times you can kind of see like, oh, this seems like a turning point, like in the way that the story was written. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's just, awesome. Yeah, it's um it is one of the amazing things about human brains, I think. Mm-hmm. That that creativity, uh one of the things that makes us human is that creativity and it it, it is to me inexplicable. I don't think it can ever be distilled down to some kind of mechanistic thing. I think it is just this thing that is beyond us, but that we have access to and I I love it. Yeah, me too. I uh, I think it's it's so cool. Um, I I only have a couple more questions. Um, okay. and it, one one of which is, what made you want to be an author? Uh, I you know what? Actually, I'm glad that you I I, I have the piece of paper you had sent me with the questions, and I'm glad I had that beforehand because I thought about that. I'm mm-hmm. not really sure. I think the reality is that I wanted to be an explorer, and I didn't. Given my age and situation at that time, I didn't see a way to do it Mm -hmm. in other ways, but I saw a way to do it as a writer, that I could explore worlds and go places by writing stories set in them. So I'm going to go with that. I think that that's really interesting. And and, um, I mean, you chose the perfect like type of writing for it too, because like what is fantasy and science fiction, if not just creating your own worlds and exploring all these new places. Yeah. Yeah. I was also, I mean, I have to confess, I also imprinted on Lord of the Rings when I was 13. So that was also very influential. You know, my bir- my first book boyfriend was Glorfindel. So I'm, I'm just that, I'm just that dorky kid. Right? <laughs> I am, I am the same way, the, though not with Lord of the Rings, but I am, I've always been the dorky fantasy kid. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I get that. Um, well, you know, it has been so awesome to talk with you today. I actually only have one more question, and that is, what do you have coming up? I have two books um, completed and coming up soon. One is the second of the space opera. So the first one's called Unconquerable Sun. Mm-hmm. It's my gender swapped Alexander the Great in space, which I love to say because it sounds good. Um, mm-hmm. And the second one's called Furious Heaven. So it'll be out in about a year, I think. I don't have a set date, but it's like winter 2023. 
Um, and then I have my first contemporary fantasy. I've never written a contemporary fantasy before, something set in our world that has fantastical elements. It's coming out next January, and it's called um, The Keeper's Six. So that's supposed to like remind you of Ocean's Eleven. <laughs> but oh, it, yeah. It's, it's, I, it's kind of a, if I call it anything at the moment, I would say like leverage meets the multiverse. So that anyway. That sounds really cool. Right. So, and if I ever had my way, Rachel Weiss would play the lead character. I know, right? Well, if you want to come back on and talk about any of these future projects, you are welcome anytime. I really had an excellent time chatting with you. Thank you so much, Molly. And thank you for your excellent questions. Of course. Thank you. You, you had excellent answers all around. This was a great interview. Um, for Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. I'm Kate Elliott. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after, the The end. end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at Read Between the Lines podcast and on Twitter at RBTL podcast. Make sure to follow the authors who I've been talking to to hear all about their upcoming projects and also because they're cool people. This show is hosted by me, Molly Southgate, and produced and edited by my dad, Rob Southgate. Read Between the Lines is a Southgate Media Group production, and you can find all the great content put on by the network at southgatemediagroup.com. You can read the story of how I and many other podcasters started in the anthology book Pod Life, which you'll find at the link in the show notes. Also in the show notes are links to buy the books featured on this episode. Using those links supports this show and the incredible authors being interviewed. Have a great week and keep reading.